evening. This is Tim Ash here uh, with my nightly update on the coronavirus uh, pandemic in Vermont's response. It's Friday, May 15th. I'm going to provide a handful of brief updates tonight uh, and hopefully uh, be one of the last bits of information you receive before uh, spending a weekend where hopefully you can get some uh, repose, some relaxation from all of this that we're going through. And on a um, sort of, not a personal note, but just in terms of the experience I normally have uh, presiding as the president of the Senate, this would normally be the last day of the legislative session. So each year we have an 18 week schedule and it is always fast and furious at the last two, three weeks. And this time around, obviously, we're not quite in the same situation. So um, this would be the last day or maybe tomorrow. Uh, but now with everything that's going on, we face kind of an indefinite uh, schedule, meaning that we have so much work uh, that is dependent on things that are outside of our control, uh, largely the, whether the federal government will step up and help Vermont and other states fill very significant revenue gaps to fund our uh, operations of government and schools and transportation next year. Also working remotely while on the one hand it's gone fairly smoothly, it also um, it can't quite replace the experience of working um, directly with one another in a room. And uh, legislating is, you know, and debating and arguing and all those things they're not so simple uh, to do remotely. Uh, it's not like a lot of work that can be done over email at home where you're sending it to people. Our work is uh, always open to the public and so therefore our communications are done together uh, in real time, visible to the world. So it really restricts a lot of the, you know, the smaller communications that might occur between people. Um, Second thing I want to give an update, the governor today, I'm about to talk in a second about the extension of the state of emergency stay at home order. Uh, but one of the things that I think is really important for people to know is that when making decisions about how fast we should open things up, whether we should open things up, there are a number of public health measures that we're all looking at. One of them is the rate at which positive COVID-19 tests are occurring. And for a while we were seeing, you know, the doubling of the number of positive tests every few days. That was in those early stages where in some cases we might have 20 or 30 or 40 new positive tests in a day. Obviously in recent, the last couple of weeks, we've been seeing somewhere between zero and eight new positive tests. Um, and that doubling is the measure that most public health and uh, experts and epidemiologists have been using. Right now, it is expected that Vermont's number of positive COVID-19 tests won't double for 40 weeks. This is obviously very good news because it means that there will be a very, very small number of tests. That's what's projected as of today. If we had an outbreak tomorrow at two nursing homes, that would all get changed. And so some might say, well, you know, if it's going to be, take 40 weeks to get another 950 or so positive tests uh, in Vermont, why not just open everything right up? Because that seems like such a small number. And I guess the way I think about it is that, you know, Vermont, Vermonters, all of us can really feel um, some sense of accomplishment that we've banded together, taken public and collective action to restrict uh, restrain the spread of COVID-19 in our state. However, COVID-19 doesn't honor state borders, meaning it's not like um, someone who lives just across the river in New Hampshire or across the lake in New York or just across the border in Massachusetts or in, in Quebec. They could very easily uh, infect people in Vermont just by a simple visit here and vice versa. So it's important to look at how those states are doing and um, while some of them are seeing signs of improvement, it's, I'll give you just a basis of comparison. So in Vermont, the number of total positive tests through this whole experience is expected to double in 40 weeks. In New Hampshire, 
it is expected to double in the next four weeks. In Maine, it's expected to double in the next four weeks. So they are still seeing fairly significant numbers of positive tests. We obviously share a lot of cross-border activity with the state of New Hampshire, whether it's people working uh, on either side uh, of the Connecticut River. Uh, we have a hospital where approximately 40% of the patients at Dartmouth-Hitchcock are Vermont patients. So we, we have to be mindful that as, a, as successful to date as our uh, actions have been, that we can't uh, imagine ourselves an island away from our neighbors, and we have to continue to be ready should some of their inferior outcomes at this point uh, start to uh, cross over the border and affect us. So uh, all of that is a prelude to saying that today the governor extended the stay-at-home order, which was due to expire today, May 15th, for another month to June 15th. The um, Most of the things I've talked about in my updates remain in place. The social distancing, making sure you don't go out in public if you've had any symptoms or anything that's uh, you've had contact with people who have known with known positive tests. All that stuff stays in place uh, to the extent there was other than the fact that the emergency order has been extended a month if there was any particular uh, new element to today's order i would say it was about the new details about lodging being opened up so today the governor made it clear that uh, lodging establishments could uh, resume operations although they will be different than they would be uh, under normal times. There will be a whole number of conditions placed on their operations, including that it is only, uh, they're only allowed to resume uh, operations to serve either essential workers who need a place to, to stay. I know a number of hotels are putting up uh, healthcare personnel and uh, guard members, others. Um, also, Vermonters, so people who may live in Brattleboro but want to visit Burlington or vice versa. People from out of state who have who can certify that they've quarantined for 14 days before coming here. Um, logs will have to be kept by the establishments. I think maintaining, I mean, it's, it says for 30 days, but I'm sure we should, they'll be keeping them longer. Uh, records of all the people who've been there so that if someone is infected, we can more successfully contact trace who they may have encountered and continuing to limit gatherings to 10 people who are on site. There are a number of other uh, more operational issues like uh, only allowing one person on an elevator at a time, cleaning uh, surfaces, limiting interactions between the staff and the uh, patrons and uh, things like that. Uh, but Campgrounds, marinas, uh, inns, motels, hotels, and short-term rentals, which people think of as Airbnb or VRBO, things like that, um, all with a capacity of 25% of what the lodging establishment could normally accommodate. So I don't know that there's that's going to result in a significant number of people um, taking Use, utilizing this new opportunity um, because it's limited to Vermonters and, and out-of-staters who can certify that they've quarantined for 14 days. Um, I, I suspect that people right now, uh, it'll be a trickle of people at first, um, but that's, the, um, that's what was announced today. I've got two other things I wanna briefly uh, discuss. One is that uh, I have received numerous questions from people in what are called close contact uh, places of employment. That might be um, cosmeticians, hairstylists, uh, people who work at nail salons, uh, massage therapists, all the people who the nature of their work requires them to physically uh, touch their clients. The governor has indicated that those establishments and operations will uh, likely be green lighted for June 1 and that announcements will be upcoming in the next week or two weeks. Um, I think it is good that people can start to think about uh, that June 1 date so they can start planning on uh, when they need to return, how to deal with childcare if that's an issue and all that stuff. Um, but I expect that more detail will be forthcoming. So for those of you who are in what are called close contact uh, 
uh, job situations, June 1 is the expected start date. It's also the expected date that restaurants will be allowed to have outdoor seating um, up to certain uh, limits. That is going to be a tricky one because, of course, not all restaurants have outdoor seating. And many restaurants will say, well, gee, if it's just outdoor seating, I don't think I have quite the capacity to make it work. But there will be some new allowance, and um, I will be working with a number of municipalities uh, and the governor's office, seeing if there are ways to fast track almost like special event uh, outdoor seating permits so that if a municipality wants to shut down a street, for instance, it would allow um, the use of a full street, say in downtown Burlington, so that people could be spaced out quite well with maybe cordoned off areas for each particular restaurant that wants to serve. So that's something also June 1st, don't yet know what it will mean for the in-person resumption of dining. I know in other states where they've opened things up, very few patrons are actually that interested in going uh, because of the potential risk. The final thing I want to talk about tonight is about food. And I've been really quite staggered by the number of Vermonters who have been receiving some kind of food aid. I think it's safe to say that in uh, pre-COVID-19, people generally think that food aid is something that goes to the very poorest people in our state and in our society, that it's something that is given out at to homeless shelters or food kitchens for uh, people with a serious number of challenges. And what we now know in this crisis with unemployment uh, over 20%, people's incomes down significantly, uh, greater burdens at home for people who have school age or childcare kids because everyone's home all the time rather than getting meals at school, that a huge number of Vermonters in some way are receiving food assistance through either the Vermont Food Bank or one of its many partner agencies around the state, whether it's feeding Chittenden in Burlington, all of the food pantries and food shelves throughout the state, large and small, uh, or the various school-based uh, food programs, including ones that are being distributed on school bus routes uh, that have been going really since the very beginning of the school closure. Today I had uh, the occasion to go to two sites, one in uh, Winooski where uh, they have, working with the food bank and the Winooski School District, they, even before COVID-19, have a vegetable and produce distribution program where families can come. They are educated in how to produce some of the healthy food that's passed out. It's free. Uh, and many of the people who are there typically uh, come from other countries. And um, it's really kind of an amazing scene, very educational, almost like a... Um, almost like a, a farmer's market, just with people being handed bags of nutritious foods. Today, it was a much larger scene than normal. And a, a, a much, a, it was the people who would normally be there plus more. And I was just very impressed that the spirit of service of both the volunteers, school district employees, food bank people, um, and the real uh, gratitude from the recipients of the food aid toward those who were helping coordinate all this. It also includes now gallons of milk from Hood. This is the result of state intervention because uh, there were dairy farmers who, because of the consistently low prices being uh, paid by um, the big companies that purchase their milk, uh, have had to dump milk in recent weeks. At the same time, many of our uh, food aid groups couldn't get milk. So with the state intervention, Hood is now supplying local uh, milk, and that was being distributed, I think, for the first time in Winooski today. So everyone there who was participating deserves a great amount of thanks. It was really quite cool to watch. Also, um, Toy Store from Virgen's, I believe its name is Wow, was there giving out free toys to anyone who had um, kids who were of the appropriate age for those. And so that was another sign of uh, philanthropy at its best. Later in the day, I was at Feeding Chittenden, which is the former Chittenden Emergency Food Shelf. And many of you saw my interview with their director, Rob Meehan, a couple weeks ago, and got to meet a number of the people who, in the first days of this crisis, stepped up and started making uh, fresh meals for 
thousands and thousands. I mean, I think they delivered 50 plus thousand in a short period of time. Uh, they also do the distribution of food to homebound Vermonters. Uh, and they effectively have a supermarket where people who have uh, few resources are able to show up and get a box or uh, a, a box plus of uh, a range of food supplies to meet their needs. And again, this was a lot of these were staff who were kind of performing at 120%. I know that's not really possible, but they were they were really outperforming anything that could be expected of them week after week after week for eight weeks. And some of their activities are curtailing now as the state uh, retools how they're gonna have some food aid delivered through schools throughout the summer. But it was just a really great occasion to see people um, and how rightly proud they were to be able to participate in that moment of meeting so many people's needs. And so I just wanna extend a very special thanks to them. And I know that that was just two sites and elsewhere in the day in Berlin, there were 1,900 cars lined up to get uh, uh, the National Guard boxes of food. They had so much demand, they ran out. So people got turned away, waited hours. And um, it just goes to show how many people right now really do need help. And the fact that even as the economy opens up, there's still gonna be way more people without jobs and with lower incomes than before. And with childcare is closed and schools with so much uncertainty, Meeting people's food needs in the months ahead is gonna be absolutely critical. Everything we can do to make sure as much of that as local as possible produces lots of uh, extra benefits. So with that, I'm gonna sign off for the night and uh, continue to say how, uh, what a remarkable experience it's been not to be the president of the Senate through this, that's just been a bit of a whirlwind, but really to experience what it's like to be part of a state where people are able to band together and take action, sacrifice um, many things, personally and economic, in order to make sure that other people stay healthy and alive. And there is no calculation that tells you when you've gone too far or not far enough. I think the state has just had to keep uh, moving and making decisions, uh, always with that public health as the big goal. And that is um, a tribute to the people of the state, not any one individual, but all of us together. So thanks so much. I'll see you back on Monday and I hope you stay safe over the weekend.